This is Sunday Morning Together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. Good morning to you. Phil Edwards here. And it's wonderful to have a guest with me in the studio this week. Sometimes they're uh, out and about. Last week, my guest, Danny Guglamucci, was in Adelaide. But this week, in the flesh, a man who's uh, probably no stranger to you if you're a regular listener to Vision, one of our chappies, Mark Kuyava. Good morning. Good morning, Phil. Great to be here. Thanks. Should should I say Mark Kuyava? (laughs) Kuyava. (laughs) Guys in the morning. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. That's the usual greeting you get on on Rise and Shine. (laughs) So, look, it's wonderful to have you here, Mark. You have been a guest on Rise on uh, what is this show? Sunday morning <laughs> together uh, before, yep. but not for a few years. So, mm. I'm sure there's a few people that aren't familiar with your story, mm. and it's a good story. We'll mm. be telling a bit later on. Mm. Uh, a little about Mark, apart from you and your lovely wife Cindy being our chaplains here mm. at Vision. Mm. So, you come in well a day, a day to two, two weeks, yeah. and look after us all. Absolutely. But you also have your finger in a few other pies. Yes. Senior pastor of the Centro Christian, Christian Church, Church. Mm, yeah, and also chaplain at a school. Yeah, yeah. Cindy and I—it's um, it's a whole school. It's a college. Um, I primarily look after secondary age, you know, grade seven to twelve. But Cindy looks over like the whole lot. Yeah, so we're we're both chaplains, part of a four-man chaplaincy team, plus a one extra Christian counselor for the school. Yeah, mm. so um, yeah, boots on the ground. I tell you what, it's a it's a wonderful environment. Great school. Um, How would you describe the ministry of chaplaincy? Well, I, it, it's very just like pastoral, you know. I, it, it's difficult because, you know, you want people to to know more about God, but you can't make them. Mm-hmm. So number one is just being that godly example, that person that's there all the time. And don't be afraid to have godly conversations in things, you know, when I'm generally talking to people. And then it's just that sowing the seed. And so everyone can be, they can be the seeker, they can be the person asking the questions to the one who's just a new Christian, to those that have been faithful. So just changing gears to where somebody is on their walk and and all I want to do is just grow good disciples. So that's that's the chaplaincy work is that in the mix of all of that is everything that they've got to deal with. And that's the welfare side of things, you know, mm. and you know, the the family unit not being together and then anxiety, all that kind of stuff. But in the midst of all that, Christ needs to be exalted in it. So if we can steer people to Jesus and get closer to Jesus, then out of that they will automatically lead better in their life. I've heard it described as being a ministry of presence. Yes, very as in true. Just being there. Yeah. Because it's often then when those things happen, you know, yep. there's a family crisis or, you know, a death in the family or there's some yep. other thing going on. Yeah. That's when people look around and go, who's here who yeah. might be able to help me? Yeah. And it's the chaplain. Yeah. Yeah. Very so. It's, it's good. It's like a satellite around the world. You're sort of sitting there. They, everyone knows it's there, but when it's needed, yep. we're there. Yeah. You know? That's yeah. so good. Mm. What do you reckon has been the most rewarding thing? In being a chaplain, because yeah. you've, you've not done it always. About two and a half years now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We had a uh, sort of, we, we were in business before while pastoring the church by vocational. And so we sort of closed that down because God wanted us to get into one lane and just fully always pastor or be with people. Um, yeah, look, there, there's been a, a couple of cool ones. One one is just about this young boy who, it was only just like a month or so ago. And uh, we have biblical studies as an actual line unit at the school where they do a test and everything, you know, like your science and English and all that kind of stuff. Yep. And he was just didn't want to be a part of that at all, you know, didn't have a faith with Jesus. And so he sat the test and hardly answered any questions and failed, you know. And we think, you yeah, know, well, that's the end of the story. Well, on the holidays, he got actually I reckon convicted by the Holy Spirit, but he got really embarrassed about that, that he'd failed something. So he went out and bought a Bible, started reading it, and during the holiday breaks came to Christ. Hmm. He believed it all by himself, Hmm. and now he's a believer and doing really well in bib studies. You know, I think just the simplicity story of that and someone coming through that stage like that, that's what just blesses me because the power of God, you know, the simplicity of the Word of God is just amazing. Yeah, that's so good. Mm. And it's only someone in education who'd call it bib studies. Yeah, I know. I know, I know, I know, I know totally. Totally. They call it bib studies or biblical studies. Yeah. Yeah, they shorten everything, you yeah, know. I know. <laughs> it's so funny. You mentioned before, Mark, about being in business mm. as well as pastoring, this mm. bivocational thing. Mm. And I think your words were that God wanted you to get into one lane. Correct. The ministry lane. Yeah. What was that process of change like for you? Because sometimes you know, when we've got a 
we're thinking, oh, should I change jobs or mm. should I move somewhere or, you know, other big decisions. Mm. It's really difficult. It, it's difficult to navigate that. Like we've been bivocational virtually our whole life. Um, it was one of the things that I decided to do early in the piece. Um, you know, the church could didn't then have to pay me. It could use its money. Like even when we were assistant ministers, we used to do that. They could use that for the building fund. So we just built up that business side of things. And and God did great things through that for many years, like probably 20, 23, 24 years. And then even before I married Cindy, we were, I was already doing that. So to all of a sudden just get a prompting. For me, Phil, it was actually a time of prayer in on an early morning. Yeah. And um and I just felt that nudge in my heart and heard heard God deep in my spirit. He said, I want you you've you've served enough by vocational, I want you to step into one lane and just be with people. T- tell me more about that because often yeah. people struggle with the idea of mm. hearing from God yeah. and for everybody it's kind of different. Absolutely. Some it's an audible voice and yep. others others it's just a knowing and yep. Somebody comes along and tells you something they had no way of knowing or yeah. a scripture. or What was it for you? Yeah, for me it was, a, okay, I've got this prompting in my heart. Um, then what I normally do in a situation when I hear something from God, obviously it's got to be something about the Bible. So it's not like, Mark, you can marry five wives now or something <laughs> like that. you know. So it's something that lines up with the word of God. But then the, the next thing I did is actually went in and talked with Cindy about it. And I said, look, this is what God's put on my heart. And – as a married couple, we, we don't move forward until we have unity together, mm. you know, in that space. So what I used is what, what in the Proverbs it says that in a multitude of counsel there's much wisdom. So you need to have people around you, you know, that you can test what you hear because we none of us hear the word of God 100% right, yep. okay? And you need to test what you're hearing, you know, because you could have had too much pizza the night before and now you have a dream. It's like, wow, is that a godly dream, you know? you got to test it. And so you ask somebody, invite somebody into that space. And then, because some people say, you know, oh, well, I don't move until I get the peace of God because, oh, the peace will come. When, well, yeah, okay, but if God said, I want you to sell your house, man, it's going to be hard to be in peace, do you know what I mean, and give it away to the poor. So that's not always 100% guideline. Oh, I've got peace. It's okay. Um, I think it's the word of God. It's it's good counsel, and then you can move forward. And then you'll see the fruit and the results in that, you know. And how it outworked for me is that a position came available in the school. Uh, I didn't know about that, but in my prayer time, God says, "Ring up the school. There's a position available." Mm. I rang up, and the guy said on the phone, you can, "I can't believe this, mate. We're just about to put this on Seek.com for the job. How did you know about it? I didn't know about it." And then I went through the interview process, and then the lady who was hiring me. God gave her a dream to say, Mark's the one. Wow. So in that process, because it was a big move for us, because we were closed all our businesses down that we had, and we were stepping totally out. So I'd say God moved that way to give confirmation, you know, and had made the way straight in that. But on a lot of decisions, you know, you'll see the evidence of that, you know, and the fruit in that um, as you take a step of faith. And the kind of lessons that come out of that of being able to trust God yeah. for the next thing. Yeah, yeah aren't possible unless you actually do move in yeah. the first place. Yeah, and that's it's hard, you know, because we want to act in faith, we want to do things in faith, but it's hard to step out. It really is. Mm. I, I still at times wonder, gee, I don't know how I'm going to do this, God, you know, but at the end of the day, um, what we did was what we thought was right in God, and um, and that's been encouraging that now we can draw back on that. And I'd say that's the other sort of like – key thing that I do when I'm making decisions is I look back at other times when God asked me to do something or confirm something and he spoke in my life and I draw upon the experiences of that and how I dealt with that to then deal with what I'm doing right now. Mm, mm. That's good. Mm. Well, very shortly we're going to take communion together mm. and you get to lead us. So yes. how, how best to prepare for communion? Yeah, yeah. I, I always like to sit myself before communion with a question, you know, what does communion mean to me? Even though I might sit at church and somebody might be talking about communion, you know, when I get the emblems, which is, you know, represented like the cordial of the blood of Christ or the cracker, which is the body, you know, whatever it is, I always then ask myself, what does this mean to me? You know what I mean? And I have a, a posture and a, and a quiet time because the Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. So then I start saying, God, I want to remember all the things that you've not just done for me, but who you are mm. and just arrest that moment. And I, and I suppose not to let communion just go past too fast. You know what I mean? It's really the center focal point of why we celebrate what we do. And when we gather, whether it's in church or in the homes or however it is, 
communion is that common union together of remembering what Christ did for us and who he is. So, Mm. yeah, prepare your hearts. Sunday morning together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. Consider the significance of what Jesus did on the cross some 2,000 years ago Mm. and the fact that he's coming back again. Amen. It's a very important part of communion, (laughs) making that declaration. Yeah. Mark, I'm going to hand it over to you. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm reading a book at the moment from Richard Stearns. He's the former CEO from World Vision. And the line this says in the book sort of sets up communion. And what I'm going to say, he says, is that God is not interested in negotiating with your surrender. You know, when we give our heart to Jesus, we sort of compartmentalize that, you know. Um, he wants it all and fully. In fact, he says in the book of Matthew, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life, he will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so maybe in front of you at the moment, you've got these two emblems, it, you know, the body and the blood. That's what it represents of Jesus Christ, that that blood that was surrendered to the Father so that we can have eternal life, broken body that was given up so that we could have a relationship with our Father again. Our sins can be forgiven. So I don't know about you, but when I think of my life with God, there are still areas of my life I don't know of are fully surrendered to Him. And so maybe we take a moment before we have communion to say, God, look, what areas do I still need to give up? Because I really want to deny myself and follow you and be that great disciple for Jesus. So we take the bread in our hands, if you've got that there, and which symbolizes Jesus' broken body. And actually it says that by the stripes of Jesus and what he endured, we are healed. So actually divine healing comes through the partaking of the bread, and that's the faith and the belief that we have. So if you have that in your hands, why don't you take that right now in Jesus' name? And then we also have the cup, and the cup symbolizes the blood that was shed. So no longer are sins just covered, but they're completely taken away, washed as white as snow. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've restored a right relationship out of the rebellion that we have in our heart. Lord God, that you've brought life to us and reconciled us through your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that we can share communion together, that we can surrender ourselves, we can remember what Jesus did for us. And, Father, we thank you that you never gave up on us and you never leave us, that you believe in us more than we believe in ourselves. So, Father, we surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sunday morning together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. My guest co-host today, Pastor Mark Kiyaba, who is uh, the, one of the chaplains here at Vision, comes in regularly to check on us all and <laughs> look after us all. And you do a wonderful job, Mark, and Thanks, your wife, Phil. Cindy. Yeah, yeah, we enjoy coming here. It's great. It's great. And, you know, you pop up on Rise and Shine. Yeah, yeah, we put our head up there, don't we? You often get to speak. But yes. do you get to choose the music? Uh, no. Well, here's your chance. <laughs> yes. I have control. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> you can make a request. Okay, okay. <laughs> make a request. Money. Yeah. So, you know, songs, music is an interesting thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, very subjective. Some people mm. love, you know, country and western mm. and other people mm. love jazz and mm. other people love something else. Mm. But when you have songs that have God at the centre. Yeah. Um, to an extent, the style becomes less of an issue. Yes. Um, but it's the heart of a song yeah. that really connects with you. Yeah. What's your choice today? Uh, my choice is a song from Mercy Me called Greater, you know, and it's inspired from the scripture in 1 John 4. It says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Mm, such a great truth, it is, isn't it? It, it is. And it's, it's, I don't know if you ever tried it before, but you get a, a like a, you know, your water bottle, the plastic water bottles, mm-hmm. the old, you know, old thing. And if, and if you take the lid off, you can grab that water bottle and just crush it in your hands. But then when you put a bit of air in and put the lid on it, you can't crush it. 
And that's what is, is with us. When when the greater one is inside us, he can push against, mm. you know what I mean? Anything that comes like a submarine going down, you know what I mean? The pressure on the outside might be strong, but the pressure on the inside is always greater, you know? And that's the same with God. The more God we can get in us, the more he can push against the things that come against our life. So, Well, that's a really interesting example yeah. because, you know, if you send a submarine too deep, yeah. then it is going to crush. Yeah, yeah. But the analogy there is that if the submarine is operating just in its own strength, so that's us, right? Yeah. If we're operating in our yeah. own strength, we yeah. will get to a point Absolutely. where we will be crushed. That's right. But if we are filled yeah. with God, yeah. then greater is he that is within with us, us, can resist that pressure from the outside yeah. you know, than he that is in the world. Absolutely. So good. And this is actually a, it's a bit, bit of a different tempo than what a- most of my guests are. Yeah. Choose at yeah. this time of the morning. Yeah, I know it's it's one of those things. I, I remember reading an old article where they, they they go run through all the different kinds of genres of music, you know, and styles of music and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. then the end it says, "But God loves them all," <laughs> and He does. I, I'm sure that God doesn't switch off when we play country. But this has got oh, a real know. cool front. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I know. Maybe there's some that send him to sleep. No, I'm only joking. But but I think this has got a cool like modern kind of groove to it. Yeah, it's just a dance song. Well, regular listeners to Vision will know this song well. It's a wonderful song. (laughs) Totally. Mercy Me, simply called Greater. This is Vision. Bring your time and bring your shame. Sunday morning together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. We're about to tell your story, or at least you are. Yeah, some of it. And it's been a, an adventure, is mm. how you described it. So these mm. days, pastoring a church mm. uh, and also in chaplaincy. Mm. Uh, but your story of your life has taken you around the world. Mm. Uh, it's taken you to the the heights of mm. chefing. Correct. Uh, it's taken you a few waves yeah. around the place as well. And uh, let's get into it. Yeah. Let's start yeah. at the beginning. Where were you born? Well, I was born in Canberra. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you Canberrian. Like yeah, yeah. I moved, we moved up from Canberra to Brisbane when I was about six years of age. So right. I'm way longer a Queenslander than I was Canberra. Okay, no uh, surfing Canberra. No so. surfing Canberra, nothing at all. Yeah, we moved to Brisbane and then down to the Gold Coast and Benoa or Ashmore. And that's where our f- parents' family home is, and we were there most of our life until yeah. I obviously got married. And what did your parents do, and well, what sort of yeah, uh, family my, situation was it? Yeah, my dad. Oh, look, I was brought up in a in a great family. You know, my my mum and dad are, are German, and they came out. You know, immigrated to Australia, mm-hmm. and my dad's a chef by trade. Mum's a waitress. You know, in the hospitality industry. Dad was the hos- um, director of hospitality and tourism on the Gold Coast, starting TAFE colleges in Queensland. Okay. You know, so quite high up there in that kind of area. But chef. And bakery goes the line of the family way back, you know, generation upon generations. But, you know, um, brought up in a Catholic church, you know, we would go to church on the weekends and things like that. But for me personally, you know, um, I knew of God, but I just had not had that encounter of God, right. you know, and that was the thing that was missing sort of in my life, you know. Yeah. And so, like, the extent of my relationship with with God. I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church, and I got sacked from being an altar boy because I got busted drinking the holy wine in between the services. So, so you could say I was just a mischievous kind of guy, you know, and uh, and so that's what I was in in my mid teens, you know, and. Um, my dad was so concerned about me because I used to surf a lot, you know, um, down at down at the Gold Coast Beach area there all the time. And year eleven or twelve, I was probably more at the beach than I was actually at school. Mm. And um, and dad took me to an occupational psychologist at the CES in those days, or Centrelink, what it's called today. Yep. And I went into this room. I did all the tests with the round and the square holes and did all that. And then You're trying to find out what yeah, vocation. You correct. Should, yeah. What I, what I could be good at. Dad was pretty concerned because I just said to dad, I want to be a sandologist. Which was my glorified name for a beach bum, right? right. Yeah. yeah, you got that. So um, we took me to the room, and they had all these videos and uh, of like jobs, like five minute videos of jobs. And so I came out with two. One was surfboard making, and the other one was a chef. And uh, surfboard making it was too itchy with a fiberglass, so I didn't like that. And the other one was chefing. And and it's funny because I went from a pretty average high school student. Really, I took I took I I, I can speak German, right? I took German and almost failed it at school. Can you mm. believe it? Because I just didn't. Didn't reply about. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then as soon as I got into chefing, it was I found my groove with that, you know. Still today, I'm the only apprentice chef to go through TAFE College. You get 100% for practical and theory in all three levels. Wow. Of yeah, chefing and, wow. and that other thing. I went on to represent Australia in the World Chefs 
Apprentice Chef Championship, won three gold medals, still the only Australian to have ever done that, you know. I remember flying back by Qantas and had the red carpet at the Brisbane airport and a chauffeur and Channel 9 and 7 and TVs and all that there, you know, the big deal. So I went from being just this ordinary guy who loved cooking, you know, and I just had this flair for it. And all of a sudden, in those days, didn't have social media, but I was on the front cover of, like, you know, the Gold Coast Bulletin or anything like that into the limelight, you know, mm. and all of a sudden it was just huge. And I remember one day I was in Surfers Paradise uh, – a little Vietnamese restaurant down a corridor I'd heard it was great food so I went down there and was eating and the Vietnamese chef came out couldn't speak English but he had the front cover of the Gold Coast Bulletin he asked for me to sign it wow he'd give a signature and I was just like this is just too much I can't even meet a back alleyway in surface and nobody know me in the expectations I remember walking up towards the Hard Rock Cafe and I had a nervous breakdown at like 20 years of age i I was 45 minutes on the floor just At 20 crying. years of age. 20 years of age. Because, you know, you know, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And I wasn't really a believer, but it was just the pressures and the expectations was too much. And mm. so I skipped out and I went to Germany and worked in Germany. I got out and worked as a chef and all around the place from mm. there. What was it that you were trying to find on that uh, journey Overseas. Well, I, th- I think in the, in the midst of it all, I just wanted to bail out from the stress and the pressures of it all. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to find myself, I think, more than and anything. And Germany, because that's where your roots were? My roots are in Germany. I'd applied for a job over this. This is another thing. I applied for a job over there because executive chef is the top one. Then you have underneath that executive sous chef, then a chef de party and demi chef. And apprentice is way down the bottom. And I applied for a, a demi chef, which is like, Way up, sorry, chef de party, which is way up like the rank, third, third or something, the and they gave it to me. Wow, straight out of my apprenticeship at twenty one years of age, you know, or just turning twenty one, they gave it, and so I, I was looking after the whole banqueting department of one of the best hotels in Germany, mm. you know. So I was online to be the youngest executive chef ever, you know. So that was my trajectory as I was going. But coming off the back of you know a mm. breakdown, mm. how did you handle that? Well. For me, it was more like um, I'm not going in any more competitions. I'm just going to do my work. I'm going to finish. For me, the drugs were a part of that, I think, uh, quite a bit in that space. Uh, surfing was a part of that, you know. Um, so I just I, I've got a few months left to go on apprenticeship. I'm going to get a finish, and I'm just going to get out. So I was trying to escape. I was trying to escape. That's yeah. probably it for me in that sense. And I was just I was sort of like I've had enough. If this is what it is, because I had like – Macasa, which is a, a, a real high-end plate company. If you go to Maya, you know, they're like $120 a plate. Wow. I had Ma- Macasa. And not even any food. No, I mean, no. Not they were just value. giving me the plates. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had <laughs> knives, like knife companies wanting me, uniform companies. I had TV deal. Pam Tamblin was about to do a morning show with a chef, and I was going to be that like on Channel 9 in the mornings before, it, before Jamie or anyone ever made it ever popular. I was touring with... You know, back Bernard King those days doing shows in shopping centres. So people were trying to capitalise on the, f- like you know, fame. Put it that way of who I was. Yeah. And it just, I was just like, I just felt empty. So when was this? What, about what year? Nineteen ninety. Okay. Nineteen ninety is when it was. Yeah. So you go to Germany. Yeah. You put your head down in, yep. in a fairly responsible position. Yeah. How did that all play out? Yeah, it was good. I was there uh, six months. did a lot of backpacking around as well. So then it was another nine months of backpacking. I was in England for a while, cocktail barman, you know, just do something different. Yeah. And the funny thing was, Phil, that God was always trying to prompt along the way, you know, like, and even though I was socially into drugs and so on like that, um, I remember one time I was going across to Amsterdam and we all know what what happens in Amsterdam to mm. party on. And I was in a train station at um, Ostend, which is the other side of Dover, across the channel. And I was waiting for my train to come. It was like one o'clock in the morning when I arrived, and just it's homeless and drug addicts everywhere. Train station empty. My train wasn't going till seven o'clock. So I got in underneath a, a seat in the train station there, put my sleeping bag up, and went to sleep. And I got woken up at about six ish or so in the morning by one of these homeless guys. You know, and I'm speaking perfect English. And he says to me, Are you, you know, you wanted to catch that train? And I went, yeah, I do. You know, so I rolled out and he disappeared before my eyes. Now, I know I'd not had any drugs for a couple of days. And I thought, man, Jess, that's weird, you know. And then you fast forward at five years and I'm saved. Okay, so we might go into that space, but I'm saved. I'm at a Bible college and I'm in an angels and demons class. And they talk about the scripture that you entertain angels unaware. And the spirit of God teaches, speaks to me. He goes, you know, I was looking after you in the train station. Hmm. And I just think about all that time space that 
you know, where I was in that space. But God was tapping on me all the way along it. But I, I, I sort of knew about it, but I wasn't, you mm. know. And so, yeah, so my German time was there, come back to Australia, and, um, and then someone takes me to church one day. Why did somebody take you to church? Yeah, good point. Um, I was dating somebody, and then another girl at the restaurant I was working at caught my eye, uh-huh. and, and, <laughs> and I started double dating her. And then eventually she said, oh, look, I used to go to a church. I'm sort of backslidden. I'm going to go to church this Sunday. Would you like to come with me? And I went, yeah, sure, no worries. And so we looked our way through the yellow pages. She got actually saved in a uh, Church of Christ but um, or an Outreach for Christ, something, and we found Reach Out for Christ, which is down at Carrara, you know. And um, so we, she said, I think it's that. So we went to that. And on that day, I, it's you know, it's a very Pentecostal-style church, you know. How was and, that against your uh, understanding of what well, church was? completely different. Because you grew up as a Catholic, Catholic yeah. altar boy. Absolutely. So completely different. But it's funny because in this stage, well, I was, I was very oblivious to it all. I really was. I was just like, hi, oh, yeah, okay. And then, oh, he talked about money. Ah, oh, you want your money, you know. Then I remember he goes, and Jesus is Lord. I went, ah, oh, that's like I used to watch Thunderbirds in the morning at 6.30 and Kenneth Copeland would come on just at the end of it. Jesus is Lord. You know, it's like, oh, he's one of those guys, you yeah, know. Right. And then he ended up doing an altar call. And I can't remember what he said, but the, the, the girl that I was with, she said, I'm going down to give my heart back to Jesus. Do you want to come down? I went, oh, yeah, okay. I literally was that blasé about it. I right. don't know what I was doing, so I just went down the front. And about 30 people getting saved on that day, and he started praying for people down the other end. And I don't know what happened, but the lights went out for me. I woke up about probably about 45 minutes later. Church had finished. Everyone had gone home, and there was a guy sitting there, and he said, hey, do you want to talk about what just happened? And I remember the first thing that happened, Phil, I got off the ground. I was a Bon Jovi fan, had my ripped jeans back then when it wasn't really cool, but it was cool. You and know? the long hair. And the long hair. No, not that, but I wish I did. <laughs> and... um. And I remember looking at myself and I said, yeah, I've, I think I've got to clean myself up on the outside because something's happened on the inside. Mm. That was the first thing I thought of, you know. And then we talked about what salvation was. And I can't even remember even saying the sinner's prayer, but just I had I had like a Paul road to Damascus encounter with Jesus. So I'm guessing you had some very, very base level understanding of things biblical. Yeah. But really not of salvation. No. Not at all. Not at all. I did, again, I had not had my own encounter with God. I sort of knew of him. I knew the Easter story. I knew everything was going on. We would go to church. Yep. You'd hear the parables, do whatever. But I did not know God for myself. And it was just that day he just tapped on my heart. But he, like I said in the last day, he'd been working on me for years. Mm. Five years earlier, I was on my way to Amsterdam for a party, you know, and God showed up in my life. And then in Germany, there was a lady at the bottom of the escalator with a sign saying, Jesus loves you. And she would just stare at me in the mornings when I was getting onto the subway, you know what I mean? And I just like d- avoided her, you know, because <laughs> God was always trying to point. And then he brings this, this other girl in my life and I get saved through that, you know. Um, yeah, anyway, it's just I, had, I just had a moment with God. You know, and from that moment on, it's been now. Now I'm uh, 54 years of age. Uh, I got saved when I was 26, and um, I'm longer now a saved person than I was an unsaved person. Mm. You know, and all glory goes to God. You mm. know, now I have a beautiful wife. I have got two great children. One's married. They're all chasing God. And, you know, Cindy and I, we work together and been working together for a long time. And uh, I couldn't be more blessed, but I just, the graciousness of God in all of that, in all that space and in his own humor, he has me pastoring a church now. I would have never (laughs) thought about that, Phil. You know, it's just a funny story of restoration, I suppose, and what he's done. Well, God's in in the restoration business, isn't he? Absolutely. He totally is, you know. And just the hand of God in all of that, you know, if you just seek him and search after him. You will find him. And wherever you are on your journey right now, if you're listening, God knows exactly where you are, and he's just waiting for you if you just open up your heart and come Mm. into it Mm. and ask him to come in. Scriptures talk about uh, being renewed Mm. by changing the way you think. Yeah. How has your thinking changed? If you look back to those years compared to today, what's different? Yeah, look, um, I must admit that when I meet old friends and that again, they tell me about the person that I used to be before, I just come in, you must be talking about somebody else because God has done something miraculously in me. But my mind still gets hammered. 
mm. you know, the old ways and what I did. My wife had kept herself for a husband. I did not, you know. And uh, and I live still at times of just random memories. It might be a, a, a song come on or something like that, and it just reminds me of the past and things like that. You know, I sort of, you know, tr- sometimes I, I don't know how Paul ever got through his life and what he did to how he got saved, you know. Yeah. And so for me, it is it, there are battles that I need to face. What and, do you do? Uh, um, first of all, I tell my wife. I said, I'm thinking this, this is what's going on, and we pray together, you know. Uh, I try to read more of the Word because that comes with, the, like, you know, it said the renewing of the mind comes through that. Mm. I just trust in God. There are many times I've begged him, please, just can you just, like, you know, control, alt, delete, just <laughs> my past, you know. I just don't <laughs> want to think about that. Yeah. But I think in this journey it, it helps me identify and that I am human as well, you know, and I can identify with other people that are going through it. Uh, but it is there is a struggle. Absolutely. I don't have any struggles for drugs or alcohol. and I haven't drunk in, uh, since I got saved, you know, or did any, anything, that kind of stuff. But the mind thing, sexual things, is a door that you open in your heart when you, you know, the two shall become one when you have sexual intercourse. There's something that happens spiritually. And sometimes if it's not right, man, you you battle that for the rest of your life because it's like, there's a connection, absolutely a connection in that. But I just keep praying into it and I keep um, before my wife and we talk about it and it's in it's in the open and she understands and helps me through with that. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I couldn't I couldn't get through life if it wasn't for that and and Jesus. Yeah. Well, mate, I really appreciate your candor there, just Thanks. being so open and transparent. Yeah. Uh, and as a pastor today, yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's actually a good reminder. Pastors are human. Mm. They've got stuff totally. you know stuff to deal with. We're all works in progress. Yeah. Absolutely. But uh, we we know the one who's in the restoration. Business. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I just I just praise God for what He's done. There are many things in my life. Like I can remember when I was in school, I you know because I, I still have forms of dyslexia. I hated reading, you know, and like you know they go that get out the book and we start in every paragraph somebody else reads. So you sort of count ahead. Yeah, and then you get the smart child that reads two and messes you up after you practiced it before it gets to you. You know, I used to hate that. And I remember one day at Bible college, God said, "I want you to get up and I want you to start reading the Bible when the teacher asks for that." And I got up, man. I stumbled. It was the most embarrassing thing because I just got gripped in fear about doing all that kind of stuff. And as I kept reading, reading, then all of a sudden, boom, got set free from that. So now. Now I don't have a problem reading or being in the in the public, mm. in that sense. And God has broken that over my life. I just had to trust Him. Mm. You know, many stories of just restoration. Mm. Now you mentioned Cindy. Yeah. How did you meet? How did we meet? Mm. Oh, look, it, there's a lot in the story with Cindy and I. How we met. Um, uh, her mum used to be my dad's secretary. Okay. And so she knew of me. I met her once. Uh, then I rocked up at her church with another woman <laughs> and got saved that day. So that's that story. Okay. okay. And so she, she was there that day. She was right. there at that at, at that day when she got saved. A few months later after I'd got saved, I, I, I called off. It was actually engagement. I called off because ju- I just felt it just wasn't right, you yeah. know. And then not too long after that, uh, they planted another church and I went to serve up that. And Cindy was the youth leader in that church and I went and served at that church. And then a traveling minister came around from America and he said, Mark, would you want to travel with me to America to do Youth, youth for Christ or youth, yeah, Christ for the Nations uh, you know, youth tours with their band and record an album. We mm-hmm. do big crusades, and I came back from that with a for a half for youth ministry. And Cindy was a part of youth ministry. You know? Okay, and so then it was just like, well, we'll just see how long Mark lasts. Do you know what I mean? Kind of stuff. She was pretty weary of the guy who's really excited about doing something newly saved. You know, kind of deal like that. Um, when I when I went to go into Bible college because God wanted me to do that, and I closed down my catering business and whatever, I had to deal with God. I said, God. I want to go through Bible college debt free. I want to experience one day what it's like to be a father. And the third thing is that can you please tell my pastor who I should marry? I won't tell that. I won't ask him of that. That's a really interesting point. I know because I I probably will mess it up. I'll mess it up. I, I need I need the right again. I had an encounter with with God, Phil, and it was just like it's God or nothing, you know. And I made that deal with God. So I'm guessing you didn't tell your pastor th- no, th- didn't about tell this. Him. Now, Cindy had said the same prayer. Wow. She said, you know, because her family were divorced, one of the senior ministers that used to be like a dad, he felt 
you know, out of ministry. And so she didn't have anyone to trust in that as well because you want to have a good soundboard, you know, when you want to have mm. a partner in that. So she'd said the same prayer too. Anyway, at this stage I was in the church, uh, working my way into being a uh, assistant minister and doing youth, and I was working with Cindy a bit. And he just goes across the table after a meeting I had with him for about, you know, an hour and a half and planning. And then he goes, oh, Mark, I just want to let you know, I'll give you permission to take Cindy out on a date. And I said, Cindy who? I'm not kidding you. I said, Cindy who? <laughs> like I was not even thinking about yeah, right. anything because I was just like, I'm going to mess this up. Yeah. I'm going to chase something my eyes see and that's not the right thing. And anyway, um, I got in the car after that meeting. I was just like, wow. I drove down the end of the road to where the traffic light was there in, in Labrador. And it was a, like a baseball bat hit me in the back of the head. And, and you know, I heard God's spade. And he said, did we not have a deal? Mm. And I went, wow. I actually went out that day and bought the engagement ring. That uh, day? That day. Yeah, absolutely. That no day. way. Absolutely. I went out that day. I bought the engagement ring. Uh, it was about two weeks later. I asked Cindy if we want to start dating, you know. And, uh, and she said yes, and we went on a dating period for about three to four months, four months, four and a half months. We then got engaged, and then it was about maybe six months later, we were married. Hmm. Yeah. It, it's, one of the, it's one of those moments again, you know, like I just had to put trust in the people that God had put in my life around me because I just knew that there was something on my life and I wanted to chase that more. You know, Cindy never wanted to be a pastor at all, never. I wanted to be a pastor or a pastor, well, never, never. But, hey, we're both in this place because we're just obedient to God. So that's how we sort of met, you know. Mm. The other story could be that, hey, I just cracked my mojo and she fell at my feet and said, yes, Lord. But we won't talk about that one. <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and she has a, a similar kind of story of, of God taking you through that to get to this place yep. where we're together. Yeah. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So what do you reckon the, the uh, biggest lesson you've had mm. from being married to Cindy? Mm. And what would she say about you? Oh, look, she says it to me all the time, Mark. I just love it how you just encourage everyone. You're just a light. Yeah. When you come I'll to a place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true, you know, and, and, and I'm always the, the, the joker in the family when all the girls are doing the girly moments. We'll joke it and bring it around and have some fun or, <laughs> or go and get hot chips, either one of that. You so know, that's, that her, that's her side of the equation. Yeah. What about you? Well, for me, for, for Cindy, the thing that has – has gotten me is her undevoted service to God. You know, like she's up every morning four thirty praying. Mm. Man, it can be freezing cold, and she'll be up at four thirty praying. And it's not—it's not because like I'm in bondage to it. It's like because this is what what I do. This mm. is the routine I've built in my life. She's faithful. Mm. She has the biggest heart to serve, which which backfires a bit because people don't appreciate that and take it for granted. She's the greatest server. You know. That's what she just loves to do. It's one of her love languages, acts of service that she does. You know, it's brilliant. Um, and she just, she's like, we made a commitment because of her past and, and her family and divorce and everything. I said to her that we will make a commitment from this day forth that we will never, ever, ever get divorced. It won't even be a word on our lips. Mm. We're going to change the direction because society said that you will probably get it. We're going to change the direction for our kids and then, you know, the generation after that. And we've done that, you know. We've, we've stayed the course, you know. And, uh, yeah, she's just a lovely woman. She's a lovely woman. And it's probably times I don't probably appreciate that enough, Phil, to be honest with you, mm. and I probably need to. Well, thanks for sharing your story, mate. <laughs> uh, better let you get ready for the best five-minute sermon yes, we'll here today. Yes, absolutely. Which is going to be about? Well, you know, I speak German. And uh, it's really hard sometimes. you got to do it in German? No, uh, oh, that's is good. No, I speak German, but it's really hard understanding another language. That's what I want to talk about. Okay. All right. Well, that's coming up very soon. Stay with us. The best five-minute sermon you'll hear today with Pastor Mark Kiava. Sunday morning together on Vision Christian Radio. We're about to hear the best five-minute sermon mm. That you'll hear today, so no pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and it's about speaking another language and how difficult that is. Yeah, absolutely. Understanding another language. I want to talk about kingdom language today. I've got a, a cool, funny story here. There's a Polish man. He moved to the US and married an American girl. And although his English wasn't you know, sort of not perfect, they sort of got along okay. And one day he rushed into the lawyer's office and asked him if he could arrange a divorce. The lawyer said that getting a divorce would depend on some circumstances and he had to ask, uh, sort of answer these questions. 
And so the lawyer then asked the first question, have you any grounds? He said, yes, I've got an acre and a half and a nice little house. (laughs) No, I mean, what is the foundation of the case? Well, it's made of concrete. I don't understand you. Does either of you hold a real grudge? No, we have a carport. We don't have a need for a garage. <laughs> I mean, what what are your relations like? Well, all of my relations, they still live in Poland. <laughs> Is there any infidelity in your marriage? Well, we have high fidelity stereo and a good DVD player. Does your wife beat you up? No, I always get up before her in the morning. <laughs> well, why do you want to have a divorce? Well, she's going to kill me. What makes you think that? Well, I've got the proof. What kind of proof? She's going to poison you? She has a bottle that she bought from the drugstore and has put it on the shelf in the bathroom, and I can read it, and it says, Polish remover. (laughs) 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 So, so, you know, learning in a life, like, I know German, and I remember living in Germany for a while, and it took forever for me to get into a flow of it because they would speak it to me. I'd think about what they just said, Translate into English in my head. Okay, this is what I'm going to say. This is going to do. What's it going to be in German to go back? And it took about three months for me to get into a flow of the language. You know, it's hard. John 8, 4 says this. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You know, understanding the language of the kingdom is not an easy thing. For instance, we worship a God we don't see. To be great in the kingdom, we serve. Death brings us life. In our weakness, we're strong because Christ brings that. The first shall be last. It's a different language. It's a different whole persona. It's a different whole posture. It's a whole different way of living life. It doesn't make sense to our natural being, but the language of the kingdom brings amazing things into our life. The kingdom of God may have a different way of doing things, but doing things the kingdom way will bring life. So try to learn another language in your life. Maybe your mind might be speaking a certain thing. The kingdom of God speaks opposite to that. Maybe you might hear your mind saying to you, you've got nothing to offer, but the kingdom of God says that you are more than a conqueror. Your hairs on your head have been numbered. You're the apple of my eye. It's a different language to learn. And the more you engage in that language, The more you get to understand that language, the more it goes into your heart, and the more you start to live a different life. So be blessed this morning. Live a great life with him. Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name for those, Lord God, that maybe are struggling to understand who they are in Christ and their identity. You know, uh, what what does this Christian walk look like? Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that you start speaking into people's hearts. Bring people around them, Lord God, to help them teach the word and bring revelation into the heart so from that Lord God they can live a discipled and a well well loving life for you Father we thank you for that in Jesus name Amen This is Sunday Morning Together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio Thank you for sharing that Pleasure Really really encouraging stuff Um, One of the things I see in your biography Mark Mm. is that one of the Great passions of your life is working with young people. Yeah. Is that still true today? Yeah, it's it's interesting. It For me, I, I, and it could be to my age, now that my daughters have grown up, one is now married and lives in Perth, and the other one is at university, so she's in and out of home. So we're sort of empty nesters, but not, you know, and sort of, and then not, you know, at the moment. It's that next season in, a, in, a, in our life. Young people, that generation, I just, I just would love to, I don't know, help. Like here's a good platform, here's a baton, you know, however mm. you want to say that, is to is to just teach the things of God and the and the beauty of God. For me, it's actually not about numbers, it's actually less. The smaller the group I love. Well, like, I know somebody else who did that. What? Uh, what was his name? Jesus. Oh, Jesus, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's so true. Like, the smaller the group, the better for me. You know, like, I'm, I'm doing a, a Bible school study with uh, five young year eights, you yeah. know, and we're doing Bible discovery method and they're hearing from God and everything. And I, 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 I love those moments, you know what I mean, where, where they get revelation, they understand God more. Yeah. 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 It's just, I would love to leave it better, the next generation, for sure. 
you're in the thick of it working yeah. with young people in a school, mm. so uh, maybe you're better informed than most on this. Mm. But a- as you think about the next generation coming mm. through and all the pressures and mm. all the different things that are out there that mm. they have to deal with today that, you know, when you and I were that age, yeah. weren't there. Yeah. What do you th- – where do you feel? You know, what do you think about this generation? Yeah, look, I, th- th- it's, a hard, it's a hard call for them, you know. Like there's it- – the thing is, like, in our day, we would maybe hear about some news, but t- maybe two weeks after it actually happened, or the newspaper or something like that the next mm. day. These guys have it live. Mm. It's live before them, you know, outplayed before them. And so we're trying to build resilience in young people. That's what we're trying to do, of, like, that, that biblical worldview of how things are, and that's the lens that you look through. Yeah. Because if they don't have any resilience, they get bombarded. Because I, I, I feel within myself – God has not created us to connect globally. I just, I just don't think like as as what they have at the moment, where you're bombarded with everything that's going on around the planet. You know, the old saying that it takes a village to raise a child. I, I think it's supposed to be more local and smaller. You mm-hmm. know, where we have connection and generational. Well, that's we the whole can, concept of family. Isn't correct. It? Yeah, but we can impact globally, but not be invaded by the concerns. You know, and that's where you get what you have these days and the uprise and. Freedom, whatever it might be, you know, because something happens in another nation and all of a sudden in Australia we've got to rise up like that. You well, know, it's, it's, it's a, hard. It's a fascinating phenomenon mm. when you look at, you know, protests that happen around yeah. the world simultaneously yeah. on issues that people often don't actually even understand. Yeah. Yeah, no. totally. There's no filter anymore. Yeah. They just yeah. they just take it on. But the flip side of that is that if you can grab the young kids from today with that passion – and put it towards and steer them towards the things of the kingdom of God. Yeah, I think it's amazing, and I don't want to be that guy who's fifty odd and just oh, look. You, I don't know how why you guys you not have no connection through a screen, you know. But they do. Some of them do, and if it's done well, it's fantastic, mm. you know. And hey, God's available twenty four seven. How cool is that? You know, it's not AI, but God, you know, through connection or whatever, it can actually work. It's just got to be steered correctly, you yeah. know, in that in that space. And um, I think good things can come from it. I can hear the passion coming up there. Yeah, but. sorry. Because <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> throw it all much. out. I don't want to throw it, like they say, the baby, you know, with the bathwater. I don't want to throw it all out. You want to see the good in the generation as well. And there is a lot of good. Yeah. It just needs to be steered. But a lot of it has been oppressed and they're hurt and they're just struggling to find their identity. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Mm. Um, look, before we go any further, let's say a huge thank you once again to everybody who responded this week uh, during our Visionathon final steps, putting fuel in the tank that we need so uh, we can just keep going in this mission uh, to take the good news of God to Australia. Uh, and uh, it's just so encouraging, isn't it, Mark? No, I totally encourage. I just love it. People, you know, just getting on board so we can, you know, reach reach lives and souls. I love 26 million people, and we believe in Australia, all, of them, yeah. all, all of them to be saved. That's it. Now, the thing I love, too, mm. is actually hearing stories. So it's mm. one of the things I love most about when we do these Visionathon events. They come out of the woodwork. Um, One of them was a lady in Brisbane. Her name is Gail. This was a conversation on Wednesday morning this week. I was in a pretty dark place. No one was visiting me. Uh, My family's in Victoria. I have a beautiful son, the best son in the world. Um, He was very caring for me. But the oppression in the house, it was palpable. It it was like a blanket. And it didn't matter what I did. I didn't feel worthy. I've been made to feel unworthy. Mm. And I didn't feel that I could pray. It was all contrary to everything I knew in Scripture. But the Lord introduced me to vision. My son was dedicating his baby, so I went to his church and joined a connect group, and they introduced me to vision. And almost immediately, the oppression left the house as soon as I started to play it. And I... I'd been stripped there pretty much, and I think vision began to fill me back up. Wow! It, um, it, it, it almost truly, really, it almost immediately cleared the house. Nothing I could do could clear this oppression. It was like a blanket; you could walk through it. Wow. And um, and I knew that that I was in a pretty much bad place because it wasn't like me. I would have committed suicide, but I couldn't because I was a Christian. So I was I was just bereft, wow. absolutely bereft. A terrible, terrible, flat, despairing place to be. But praise the Lord, he introduced me to a vision which I believe is God's gift to Australia. Oh, pretty amazing. Gail talking there with Fel and DJ on uh, Wednesday morning this week. Yeah. And, you know, she talks about vision there, but really this is the Word of God yeah. in its pure, unadulterated form is what Absolutely. she's talking about, that she's heard 
the truth that has changed her world. Yeah. But it's actually God at the center of it. Yeah. We're just the, the carrier. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the vehicle, isn't it? You know, it's like praise and worship is just the vehicle of, of, of giving adoration back to God, you know? Yeah. I just love it. And I also, I'm, I think about all the people that don't know still about vision. You know, like what about, what about letting people know mm. about this? You know, get it out there. Well, funny you should say that. Yes. Coming up uh, next month, we're going to have a big focus around that and uh, just planting that seed of an idea mm. of, um, hey, tell someone. Yeah. Or two or 10 or 100. Yeah, exactly. As many as you can. <laughs> Let's spread the word about this thing. But, you know, we thank God for you as a supporter of Vision making this possible. Uh, we can't do this without you. And we also thank God for people like Gail and the testimony of his uh, work in her life, mm-hmm. changing her through his word and through the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And that's just one little story. Mm-hmm. There's plenty more out there. So um, this is exciting stuff to be part of, isn't it? Absolutely. Love it. Really good. Uh, now, our tradition at the end of our time together is to pray for our nation. Yeah. Great country we are, you know, we are custodians of. Yes. Uh, we're only passing through yeah. and uh, we need to, one, look after it, but two, I think be faithful in our mm. um, pursuing God mm. and helping our fellow Australians mm. and also to pray for our nation. Yeah, absolutely. Would love to pray for it, Phil. Can you lead us? Absolutely, absolutely. Father, we do. We, we come before you, Lord, um, creator of the universe. Lord, we thank you, Father, from the north, the south, the east, and the west of our nation. Father, we, we, we stand by faith to believe that this is a Christian nation and the banner over this nation is Jesus Christ. Mm. And so, Father, we thank you for that, Lord God. We thank you for the work that you've called us all to do, to share your good news. We thank you for favor. And, Lord, in a sense, we pull you know, on, on the move of your spirit. And we thank you, Father, for a harvest to come, an awakening to come to our nation, Lord God, from all generations, all ages, in every area, Lord, of work, in society, in schools, in highways, Lord God, byways, towns and country areas. Lord, that there be a move of your spirit, Lord God, that people will come to repentance to see how good and great our God is. Father, that we stand in the gap for our nation today, Lord. Lord God, and we thank you, Father God, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm, amen. Well, thank you once again. It's been Pleasure wonderful. Been. Thank you, Australia, for listening as well. <laughs> for putting up with us this yeah. morning. Uh, and thank if you'd, you, like to, you'd like to catch up, by the way, there's a podcast of this program that pops up uh, in about an hour's time in the Vision app, and you can listen again, share it with your friends. Uh, and if you missed Mark, Mark's story earlier, mm. well worth listening to again for that. Mm. So God bless you, mate. You too, mate. Thank you for having us. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.